designed world is a world of people and things. Design stands in between, the place where them and us meet. In the story of design, the 1920s and 1930s was the period when the relationship between us and our things was subject to radical re-examination. A new social landscape emerged from the destruction of the First World War and brought with it a new mental landscape, one in which the machine loomed large. This prompted a number of questions. Should an Englishman's home be a castle or a machine for living? Le Corbusier built this corridor with the same measures of a train's corridor. So it stands for engineering and it stands for future. Is the kitchen the heart of the home or a factory for food production? Margaret herself uh, was around with a stopwatch and kind of uh, studying how women worked in a kitchen and how it could be improved, trying to reduce the number of steps that people took from the stove to the sink and so on. How many legs does a chair actually need? Well, imagine if you could take air and fry it and it became stiff, and then you sit on it. That wouldn't be bad. The answer to questions like these reshaped the world then and now a world of people and things, and the design that joins them together. In 1919, less than a year after the guns on the Western Front fell silent, a new art school opened in Germany. In 1926, it came here to a purpose-built building branded with its own distinctive logo. To the residents of Dessau, it was clear that something altogether new had sprung up on the edge of their town. But what exactly? Now they're coming from uh, Dessau, from the center here, from the south direction, to the Bauhaus. And the first thing that they see is the Bauhaus letter and the building. It was like a light fire in the landscape here. It looks like industrial factory, but it's a school inside. So the message is they want to educate the young people to make products and design in the industrial fashion. The Bauhaus was the center of new thinking, and the pieces that they produced were the furniture of the new thinking. I actually think the Bauhaus was quite punk rock. It was quite a sort of punk, anarchic sort of sense of looking at something and turning it on its head. The Bauhaus was about bringing together sort of, you know, groups of disciplines and sort of smashing them together and seeing what came out. The Bauhaus was an art student's dream come true. An intoxicating mix of free love, avant-garde posing, and legendary parties. But there was a serious side too. The curriculum, devised by Bauhaus founder Walter Gropius, set out to break down the boundaries that since the Industrial Revolution had grown up between design and architecture, craftsmanship and mass production, designing and making. This was designed to be an education without frontiers. I think that's an interesting thing. 
This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. You had fantastic painters, fantastic theater designers, potters, silversmiths, furniture designers, graphic designers. They all worked together. There was no separation. There was no uh, division. The architect, the construction worker, the brick worker, the carpet maker, the painter, the furniture maker, everybody. They want to open. They want to let the construction workers learn from the artists and the artists learn from the construction workers. You are exposed to the complete range of art and materials, right? And everybody goes through that first degree. It's like basic training in the military. For the Roundheads in Gropius's new model army, the enemy was this. Sensual, organic, and highly decorated, Art Nouveau had become the dominant design style of the turn of the century world. Art Nouveau offered a kind of branding of contemporary life. It was the beginning of a sort of designer lifestyle. It was very emotive, semi-erotic in many cases, or very obviously erotic in others, the incorporation of naked women into furniture pieces. The Austrian architect, Adolf Loos, had been one of the first to try and hack back at its viney tendrils. In 1908, he railed against Art Nouveau in a diatribe entitled Ornament and Crime. For Loos, the stakes couldn't have been higher. The evolution of a culture, he proclaimed, is synonymous with the removal of ornament from utilitarian objects. They thought that this ornament and over-decoration is a masquerade. And they want to give the objects a good quality without masquerade. Lowe's was proposing the idea that the use of excessive de decoration debased society somehow, that it was um, an excessive use of resources. If you strip away all surface decoration from a product so that all the energy, all the effort is going into the integrity of the fundamental object, the idea then is that using that uh, approach, you can produce high value objects in high numbers for reasonable cost. And that is the most democratic way to design and manufacture products. You're providing the most of the best to the greatest number of people for the least. That's a really important credo for the modern, birth of the modern movement, actually. It was not a question of a style. They did not want a style. It was counterproductive for them to think about a style. They want to have the vision for a new kind of life, and also they want to also yeah, educate the people to become a new human behavior for the 20th century, for a new future. Every design revolution, from the Stone Age to the Digital Age, has its signature technology. For the modernists, it was this, tubular steel. Using techniques originally developed for making bicycle frames, tubular steel could be shaped into structures that were lighter than wood, but far stronger. This was a new product, a new technique, and open up a completely new field of solutions. Suddenly you had here a very good light material, visually very exciting, which you can paint, which you can chromium plate, you can just leave it steel. You know, you can have all sorts of possibilities. 
And that was a very important period. For designers, the test bed for all new technologies is the chair. The chair occupies a privileged position in the design world. Half structure, half product. It's the place where architecture meets design and where the designer's skills are tested. Have you ever tried to design a chair? I can assure you, it's not simple at all. The chair is always a, almost a litmus test for a designer. It's the most difficult item to design, most challenging. And because we are all, all of us are different shape, it has got the element of compromise. It's impossible to sit down and say, I'm now going to design a classic. It would be extremely presumptuous more than anything else. But there are some moments for designers where they have you know, perfect moments where, for example, a company says to them, I'm going to give you a certain technology to work with. And what usually happens is the icon of that typology gets designed very early on. And it's quite hard to move away from them once they've been defined. For Marcel Breuer, a former Baja student who returned to teach there, tubular steel was his shot at design immortality. The story is that there was a party in the Bauhaus and Breuer had designed the little Lazio table, and he was talking about it and the philosophy of it, etc. A few drinks later and a few conversations later, he said, and what I'm going to do next, and then everybody was listening, he said, I'm going to turn the table on its side, and I'm going to have this as the leg, and I'm going to have this as a seat, and here I'm going to split the tube, turn it up, and I'll put the back there. And there you are. Seat, seat, back, back. Voila. For Breuer, the gravity-defying cantilever construction of his chair clearly suggested other, even more radical possibilities. A chair with no legs at all. It was very acceptable for the Bauhaus philosophy to, yes, overstep that boundary of reality and just say, and eventually we'll sit on compressed air. Fried air, which is an Italian saying for things which are meaningless. But imagine if you could take air and fry it and it became stiff, and then you sit on it. That wouldn't be bad. For designers and architects, the modern world was full of urgent hints about new and better ways of doing things. In a warehouse in Germany are the remnants of some of the lessons taught by the new machine age. These are the first ever examples of a domestic fitted kitchen, designed by the Austrian architect Margareta Schutelhotsky. Margarete was not very fond of cooking, and she always said, I even can't uh, make a coffee. So she didn't like uh, cooking very much, but she designed the kitchen very carefully. Margaret came in with this radical idea, which is now known as the Frankfurt Kitchen, which was basically the first really mass-produced fitted kitchen. The idea that she had was to uh, to rationalise women's work. When people actually went in to use the Frankfurt kitchen, there were many things that were great about it. Yep, it was very efficient and white clean and uh, very functional, but people found them very cold. There were a lot of uh, responses to it, that it was very sort of alien. And uh, yeah, it was like a factory. It was like a kind of a, a, a kind of galley kitchen from a ship. I look at kitchens today and I mean you can see where those have come from. 
they've come from those old ideas that we want to have everything kind of neatly organized and we want it to function well and we want to be able to serve our family in a way that actually makes sense. But who's to tell me where I keep my bread? Half the time we keep our bread in the microwave, you know, because it's the only storage place that will keep it dry. That idea of imposing a vision on somebody and expecting them to live up to it is, is an absolutely impossible dream for any designer. So, you know, I always say this to our clients, you need to create something that's adaptive, you need to build in flexibility, and you need to allow the person their right to customise the experience that you're creating for them. But designs for living weren't just confined to the kitchen. In Wiesenhof, a suburb of Stuttgart, the city council offered designers and architects a larger canvas, a whole estate of houses, show homes of the future. So this was a kind of very radical thing for the, the city of Stuttgart to do. And they rounded up the kind of the real young guns of architecture. You know, you had Bruno Taut, you had Mies van der Rohe, uh, you had Walter Gropius, you had Le Corbusier. You go there now and you think, Blimey, if things were built now, they would still be regarded as radically modern, let alone in the mid-twenties. You know, these beautiful cubist blocks right up on the hillside. The double house on Rathenaustrasse was designed by the Swiss-born architect Le Corbusier. <laughs> Le Corbusier's design went one step further than the fitted kitchen. This was a fitted house, and the architect had thought long and hard about how the modern family would fit into it. Corbusier's idea was to divide space up into served and servant spaces. So over here we've got the bathroom down in the corner, which is not the kind of bathroom you want to hang out in. It's the kind of bathroom you just want to go and have a quick shave in. Here we have a kitchen area, which is sort of very much a kind of area where your maid would be there serving you if you're having your, your lunch out here in the kind of living dining space. The whole idea was to shift all the kind of servant spaces, the kind of spaces for drudgery, make them as small and as remote as possible, and open up space for living, for being entertained, for, for leisure pursuits, I suppose, essentially. So complete division, oil and water. You know, this was a machine for living in. Like the fitted kitchen, the fitted house took its inspiration from outside the domestic sphere. They obviously built this corridor with the same measures of a train's corridor. So it's 60 centimeters and the heights of two meters and five. Like in each train at this time and so it's a very theoretical corridor but it's very important to connect his house with the train so it's a modern traffic machine so it stands for engineering and it stands for future Le Corbusier's obsession with the machine was that it was liberating it would be liberating it would free you so you could literally adjust the interior to suit your life, you could transform it. The idea that a house could be flexible, could ch change in the future. We are now in the living room and you can change this room to, for the night use into sleeping compartments. You bring the bed out, or pull the bed out of the uh, built-in cupboard and you can bring out the second bed for the couple here and then uh, you can close the sliding wall um, to separate the sleeping room of the child from the sleeping room of the parents. Now that gave an immense freedom. It meant that both the architect and also the inhabitant of the house could shift the arrangement of the interior, the plan, to whatever they wanted to do. There's not much kind of running around the house. You know, it's not, everything's sort of kept very, very tight and close and efficient. <laughs> But freedom and flexibility came at a price. These were designs to live up to rather than just live in. 
he had these kind of slightly freakish views about communal living. Um, he, he sort of had ideas that we should be living like uh, students in a college or monks in a monastery, that actually our private space should be actually very, very small and we should be sharing our communal space with lots of other people and actually living like an artist, like he lived, actually. In a sense, Le Corbusier never got over his potty training period emotionally as a Swiss designer, control, complete control freak, um, who wanted to tidy the world up. The problem is that that might have been fine for a few people, but it actually wasn't a solution for mass society. People actually liked their private space, actually. They liked to retreat as well as hang out on, on sun terraces. I mean, modernism is always about enormous expectation, you know, and provocation mixed with disappointment. The term is correct, modernism. It is a poetic reflection of the modern age. So you bend a steel tube and you stretch some canvas and you've got a modern object, hence a functional object. But they weren't all functional. I have a lot of Bauhaus furniture in my house. It is, without exception, none of it is comfortable. I don't sit in those chairs very often. I sit in a comfortable chair and look at those chairs. And that's basically what they're for, is to look at. A lot of the modernists were prescribing how, not just how you would sit, but also how you would live. And that's what got us into trouble. Corbusier's original plan for Paris was to wipe out the old Paris and start new with these ridiculous towers with cars connecting everybody in between. It's a nightmare. This was his vision. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of cities started doing. And we are now repairing ourselves from this era. Corbusier's vision was very destructive. Now, he had some great designs for furniture and actually some interesting houses. And if he had only stuck to that, we would have all been better off. The modernists had set out to break down the barriers that separated creative disciplines. But as the city-sized ambitions of Le Corbusier make clear, there is a fundamental distinction between architecture and design, as well as between architects and designers. You've got to remember, architecture is big and heavy and slow <laughs> and takes a lot of money to build. Design can respond much more quickly to changes in people's desires. It's basically more nimble, it's lighter, it's smaller. It's easier to do, frankly, than architecture. It's easier to change you know, your, your chairs and your furniture than it, than it is to change your building and a whole way of life and a whole environment. But it's not just a difference in scale and speed. There's also a question of temperament. We talk about designers as T-shaped beings, which means that you have a depth in something, you have a downstroke in something, a depth in craft, but a breadth and an empathy towards a lot of other disciplines. But I often think of architects as, as more maybe I-shaped. It's all, it's a, it's a depth in craft and less of a breadth in empathy. Architecture can often be quite a sort of solitary, visionary pursuit um, and and I don't think design works like that. We're not the guru in the atelier. As the roaring 20s gave way to the low, dishonest decade that was the 1930s, the political context in mainland Europe changed dramatically. For architects, for designers, for everyone. The change was not for the better. In 1932, the Bauhaus closed its school in Dessau as the local branch of the Nazi party flexed its brown-shirted muscle. Bauhaus founder Walter Gropius moved to Britain. He came here the Isacon Flats in Hampstead, designed by architect Wells Coates. Alongside Gropius in the minimalist service flats with their communal dining room was fellow Bauhauser Marcel Breuer. Also resident was crime writer Agatha Christie, who likened their new home to a giant 
ocean liner. But this was not the typical face of modern Britain in the 1930s. Just a few miles from the Isacon Flats is the Holly Lodge Estate, where high-rise living was half-timbered and ocean liners was something to see the world in rather than to live in. This is what people wanted, and this is how people wanted to live. Modernism, you could say, was trying to be a little bit too clever sometimes, a little bit too pared down, too simple. And that was very cool and stylish if you were into that kind of thing. But frankly, most people weren't. Begun in the mid-1920s and added to throughout the 30s, the Holly Lodge estate was an alternative response to the demands of living in the modern world. This is a typical housing estate from the 1930s. Each one of these is a little castle. It's the Englishman's castle. It's the epitome of that. It meant that you were living out the old English idyll. Everyone wants to live in a thatched cottage or a wonderful hammer-beamed Jacobean house. And that's exactly what these houses gave you the impression that you were doing. After the, the First World War, uh, there was a, a longing to return to the pre-war period. After all, that was such a golden age. Just at this time, what do we invent? We get the three-piece suite. And that says it all about what we're really interested in at that time. It's all about comfort. <laughs> This was also the moment when Second Hand rebranded itself as Antique. Hampered by death duties and plagued by the lack of servants to clean and polish, the great and good had, since the end of the Great War, been selling off the family silver, as well as the family mahogany. For the aspiring British middle class, a timeless classic with aristocratic connections trumped tubular steel with modernist pretensions. And of course the houses also were full of provision for ornaments, for little details of, of living as well. The, the fireplace, the mantelpiece, uh, retained its sort of iconic status as one of these. You had this provision, this shelf for all of your ornaments, for your household goods, for your little status symbols, and for your heirlooms. And if you didn't have heirlooms, you could just go out and buy some. Alongside the mock Tudor, there was mockery too. Cartoonist Heath Robinson poked gentle fun at the modernist lifestyle in his book, How to Live in a Flat. I think one of the big objections to modernism from people like Keith Robinson or the satirists, uh, or even the people that made serious objections, was the fact that they didn't like being told what to do. The British don't like that. We don't like being told what to do. But the most enduring symbol of British design from the period was a characteristic combination of the modern and the whimsical. If Heath Robinson had been asked to design an electricity pylon, he might have come up with something like this, the angle poise lamp. George Carmadine was a British engineer obsessed with car suspension systems and Euclidean geometry. He wasn't thinking about creating a masterpiece of design when he approached spring makers Herbert Terry and Son to help him with his experiments to suspend objects in space. He took out a patent in about 1931, and it was called Elastic Force Mechanisms. And this was ways of trying to balance things in, in space and use springs and levers and cams. 
It was then that Carbodine had a light bulb moment. He suddenly realized, well, I could put a light bulb on the end of this and control it with a shade. And then I, I have a way of putting light where exactly where it's needed. As it moves here, this stays parallel. So if you're working at a desk or drawing board or something, you can adjust it there and you don't have to readjust the height. In a sense, it's not designed. It's based on pure engineering principles. It's quite unusual in a product you actually see the workings. This is like seeing all the, the valve springs, all the pistons in a car. It brings a bit of engineering out of a, a box and visualizes it on their desk. There's a certain elegance in this, this product. And I don't know where it came from. I don't think George designed it. I think it was, he was just had a natural feel for the right sort of dimensions and that, you know, if it looks right, it is right. It's part of the landscape. It's as, the same as, you know, telephone boxes and London taxis and route master buses. You instantly see them where, whoever you are in the world and you know those are British icons. In 1935, Le Corbusier, the high priest of modernism, made a trip across the Atlantic to bring enlightenment to the USA. He went full of high hopes for work from a country that had seemed determined to build itself out of the Great Depression. He was surprised that there were no press photographers to greet him when he arrived. The first of a series of misunderstandings that would characterize the encounter between the world's most modern architect and the world's most modern city. In an article, he confessed to more complex reactions. Everything here is paradox and disorder. Individual liberty destroying collective liberty. A hundred times have I thought New York is a catastrophe. And 50 times, it is a beautiful catastrophe. Well, New York City is beautiful, and it was beautiful then because of the density, because of the congestion, because of the mess in every building, slightly different style. No one has a control over that. That's determined by the market. You know, it's determined by commerce. The simple truth was that Le Corbusier was too late. By the time he arrived in America, the future had already happened. From the canyons of Manhattan to the production line of the Ford Rouge River plant, which Le Corbusier visited, America had already chosen its destiny. This American future would be driven by the dynamos of capitalism, consumerism, and individualism, and the market would reign supreme. The difference between American and European design is fascinating. European design is more concerned with the self-expression of the designer versus American design, which is way more pragmatic. It's about the mainstream, because that's where the money is. That's where the manufacturers are interested in operating. They're not interested in catering to an elite, progressive, um, avant-garde uh, type clientele. They want to get their products into Walmart. The designers who served the American market in the 20s and 30s knew what commerce expected of them. It would be appearances on the cover of business magazines rather than manifestos that would get them a seat around the boardroom table. But once they were there, they knew how to knock them dead. These were to be artists in industry, not applying art later, 
but in a collaborative effort with the manufacturers. These guys were some of the greatest renderers of all time. They knew how to draw anything. They knew how to make it vivid, exciting. You know, to see these things in the flesh is fascinating. Niels Diffriant worked with designer Henry Dreyfus for more than 25 years. Henry had a trick. That was he carried in his coat pocket a pocket full of little short pencils. And when he was talking to a client, he would take one out and draw something right for the client. This is the way your clock should look, for instance. The clients were all amazed by this. So Henry took this one step further, and over a table or a lunch table, he would draw it upside down to face the client. And of course, that was as good as selling the job on the spot. Anybody who could draw upside down was clearly talented enough to make this product be a big seller. Corporate America realized that design works. You know, that, that if they revamped their product or redid their corporate identity and made it relevant to people, that their sales would improve, and this was a way of getting closer to consumers. Getting closer to consumers meant attending to their dreams and desires, as well as their needs. Designer Raymond Louis understood that better than anyone. His definition of good design was an upward sales curve. Raymond Lowy was, I think, the first design consultant. Not the first industrial designer, but the first design consultant. The first person to really marry commerce and art into one seamless offer that manufacturers were interested in and that people needed. What Raymond Lowy bought was pizzazz, excitement, emotion to functional objects. Louis accepted that what people wanted didn't have to make sense. He took the principle of streamlining, originally developed to make planes, trains, and automobiles go faster, and applied it to things that were going nowhere fast, like refrigerators. Sales of the streamlined cold spot fridge jumped by 600%. It's absurd when you see a vacuum cleaner and it has these kind of wings on it, you know, like a rocket ship. And that's obviously just a, a style, you know, a, su a superficial style. But I think there was a lot more going on there. And I think what Lowy and, and people like that were doing was giving to everyday Americans an opportunity to experience the modern world, you know, in their everyday, where there was a toaster or a telephone or, you know, an automobile. But behind the salesmanship and the crowd-pleasing styling, American designers developed an approach to design as rational as Le Corbusier and as rigorous as the Bauhaus. But rather than starting with a theory about how people should be, a designer like Henry Dreyfus started with what they were actually like. Well, this is the, the first iteration of the Big Ben uh, done by Henry Dreyfus around 1931, 1932. He got his foot in the door doing the clock faces. And there are dozens and dozens of studies of, for instance, the hands, which you will notice have a little channel inside. Dreyfus did some informal studies to try to assure that these were very visible to sleepy eyes, and in fact, would set them up along his bedside to go off at intervals of an hour throughout the night to judge them, which he claimed was as close as he and Doris Marx ever came to getting divorced. I mean, this was a dollar clock. This was not an expensive item. And yet, it's taken on the appearance of a much more luxurious item. Notice the gold finish inside that molding, which is silver on the outside. It's rather subtle at first, but it does make a difference in the appearance. It's a beautiful little thing. And when you think about this as just a simple mass-produced object, one of the first, really, that would have been seen in most American homes, an affordable piece of modernity that was a functional item and worked well. Acting as guinea pig for his own designs was just the beginning. Drawing on time and motion studies, just like Schutte-Lohotsky had done, Dreyfus developed a systematic approach to design based around idealized male and female figures. He would eventually christen them Joe and Josephine. Typical Americans, from their heads to the tip of their precisely measured toes. 
Henry Dreyfus called it human factors, you know, the science of the interface between people and things. And it really is a science. There's a lot of actual measuring of things, distances, heights, weights, all those sorts of things. But more than that, a lot of observational stuff. I mean, you could say he was the father of observational ethnographic research because he used to look at how people actually use things, how they sat in a chair and so on, which is what designers do today. Like Raymond Lowy, Dreyfus knew how to make the advanced acceptable, as is apparent in his Model 302 telephone, a classic piece of design that put the modern world into the hands and the homes of millions of Americans. This is the Model 302 telephone of approximately 1936, 1937. It's the first pure Dreyfus phone. This was the American telephone during the 1930s, or the later 30s and most of the 40s. We're talking somewhere in the range of 160 million units. I mean, we're talking about a piece of design that almost every American had contact with, repeated contact. And, and to me, that's a remarkable achievement and a remarkable way to lead people into thinking in a modern way. The contrast with the telephone designed by the Bauhaus is revealing. Well, I, the first thing I see is geometric purity. I mean, that the, the overall contour here mirrors almost exactly the form of that transmitter, whereas here we have a more generous, in fact, rather streamlined housing. You know? Uh, look at the very square contours here versus the sculpting here. This creates a visual lightness. I, I mean, this is a lovely design. Its visual lightness sort of comes from the gap that you see here between those flush sides and this rather dramatically shaped handset. But again, one advantage to the Dreyfus phone over uh, this rather hefty phone that has no convenient way to move it. Maybe we should just look at the backs because there's a little more sophistication here than in the European example. You know, this is sort of a 360 degree sculptural entity where this just seems to terminate rather abruptly in the back. Here is a phone with no ambitions to be anything other than a telephone and to look like a piece of equipment. This has a little more concessions to fitting into a domestic interior. I would say this is the more theoretical phone, and this is a little bit more the consumer item. It's a wonderful sort of shorthand for the difference between Europe and America. <laughs> By attending to the dreams and desires of consumers, as well as their needs, American designers brought the utopian visions of European modernism down to earth. It's telling that one of the most iconic examples of modern American design from this period emerged from a backyard workshop rather than from the lofty heights of the designer's drawing board. The Airstream Trailer, first created in 1933 by Wally Byam, an example of what you might call folk modernism. Wally wrote an article about how to build a trailer, and he sold that uh, article for 50 cents. And uh, people tried to build them, and they couldn't, so they come to him about it. So he says, let me build one for you. So he went out in his backyard, started building trailers. Wasn't long before he was manufacturing trailers. The war came along, Second World War, why uh, the government took all the aluminum and he had to stop production. So uh, he went to work at an aircraft factory. And I'm sure while he was doing that, he'd come up with a lot of different ideas that he was gonna do when the war was over, you know, to put into his trailer and to manufacture it. What kind of thickness of metal he wanted to use and how many rivets per square foot he wanted to use. He got a lot of that information off those airplanes when he was working with them. 
Christopher Deem redesigned the Airstream trailer in 2000. I had grown up seeing these things hurtling down the freeway. And once I started designing as being an architect and doing real design, I started to really look at them for intelligent uses of space. They combined both architecture and furniture into this unified whole. And then the fact that it's, you know, flying down the freeway makes it even crazier. Biome's design delivered on the promises made by modernism and the market. It was a machine for living and a dream machine. Le Corbusier meets Henry Dreyfus from a designer who'd probably never heard of either of them. Usually, if somebody's never been in a trailer, their first revelation is, wow, this is all I need. I could live in this. And they, you know, it allows your imagination to imagine your life in a different context, in a stripped down, minimalist, um, kind of very essential way of living. If you don't like the scenery today, you can hook up and move on. You don't have to worry about where are we going to sleep, where are we going to eat. Uh, these vehicles are fully self-contained. They have everything, all the comforts of home. And a bathroom, anytime you want one. If the 1920s and 30s dramatized the choice between top-down utopianism and bottom-up consumerism, the verdict of today's designed world lies with consumerism. Consumerism swallowed modernism's most radical schemes. Some, the fitted kitchen, open plan living, tubular steel furniture, were effortlessly absorbed. Others, the high rise and the high hopes for a new kind of human being, have been chewed up and spat out. In today's designed world, we see Habitat rather than Bauhaus, Dreyfus rather than Le Corbusier. I think Le Corbusier as an architect wanted to impose a certain vision and Dreyfus as a designer wanted to kind of include everybody in his vision and bring them into that process. So, you know, I talk a lot about the idea of design now as a dialogue with the user. And I think that's the journey that has gone from architect to design, is that journey from monologue to dialogue. <laughs>